You know, dating was tough in the early 1900s. Like you couldn't just hop on Tinder, you know? And the subject of today's story, Belle Gunness, had to take ads out in the newspaper to get men to show up at her farm and show her a mildly good time. But it wasn't just a good time she was after. She was after their money. But sadly for Belle, once she got her hands on their money, these guys would usually dip. They would just completely disappear. I'm just kidding. She killed them. Some say that she's America's first female serial killer, but literally no one can agree on who America's first female serial killer is, but she did kill at least 14 people. And some people believe she may have killed as many as 40. (gasps) They didn't call her Hell's Bell for nothing. So today, let me tell you the crazy story of Belle Gunness. And the craziest part of the story is allegedly she got away. If you're new here, my name is Elise, and today you're going to see Elise talk about true crime. I post a weekly series on YouTube called Cleaning and Crime, where I post a cleaning motivation video while at the same time I'm telling you about a true crime case that's interesting to me. But this video that you're currently watching is the crime only bonus video version of today's story. For those of you that aren't into the cleaning, if you're looking for the original with the cleaning, I'll put a link to that video in the description box down there, or I'll put a thingy over my head right here. And as always, you can also find the Cleaning and Crime podcast wherever you find your favorite podcasts for those of you that just want to listen. All right, guys, I don't speak Norwegian, so forgive me while I butcher all of these names. Brynhild Paulsdatter Storseth was born on November 11th, 1859 or so, we think. Birth records weren't exactly amazing in the 1850s. (laughs) And Brynhild was the youngest of eight children. The family raised livestock on a farm that they rented that was only about an acre. And the father of the family also worked on the side as a stonemason. Now, listen, this story is obviously super freaking old. And it's also pretty famous. So there are a ton of sources. There are movies, documentaries, books, audiobooks, podcasts, tons of articles. And everywhere you look, you're going to get a different version of the story because it's so old. We don't really know exactly went down as far as every detail goes, but we have a pretty good idea. So just take this with a grain of salt and just sit back and enjoy the story. Okay, so let's go back to Norway really quick. We know that the family was very poor and they struggled to put food on the table for the family of 10 and they struggled to pay for firewood to keep the house warm. And it was Brynhild's job to scavenge for wood. She also worked on the farm and she also got another job at a different dairy farm. So she was busting her ass as a kid to try and help keep the family afloat. So because of this... Brynhild started to really resent being poor and she started to obsess over money and she had big dreams of being super, super rich. Now, rumor has it Brynhild became pregnant when she was 17 in 1877. We don't really know who the father was, but some versions of the story say it was just a wealthy boy in town. Some people say it was the son of the wealthy family that owned the land that they were farming. But the story seemed to imply that perhaps Brynhild was trying to snag herself a rich man. Brynhild was described as a large woman between 5'9", 5'10", and maybe between about 200 to 250 pounds. Described as tall and thick and strong and homely, with small eyes and a thin mouth always turned down into a frown, giving her the appearance of a frog brutal. And she was also from a poor family. So it's not like she had a bunch of hot, rich dudes beating her door down, you know? But now that she was pregnant, it was looking like there was going to be a quick and hasty marriage to avoid shame. But rumor has it, whoever this rich guy was, was not having it and he did not want to get married. And while out at a country dance, he beat up Brynhild and he kicked her in the stomach causing a miscarriage. Now, there were other versions of this part of the story as well. Some versions say it was just some random rich guy at the country dance that just decided to kick the pregnant girl in the stomach for shits and giggles. Who the hell knows? But what we do know is that after Brynhild lost this pregnancy, she had a very dramatic personality change. I mean, that was very traumatic and she would never be the same. The stomach kicker, whoever he was, died shortly after this event from a stomach ailment himself that was believed to be stomach cancer. But later it was believed that he died from possible arsenic poisoning. But again, not proven. So 
Brynhild, with no baby, no man, no marriage, and kicked out of her home because her family was ashamed of the pregnancy out of wedlock. So she worked as a servant at a wealthy farm for a couple of years. But by 1881, she was like, this sucks. I don't want to be a servant anymore. I want to be rich. And she heard that opportunity awaited in America. And her sister had already gone to America a few years prior. So she had family there that could support her. So Brynhild got herself a boat ride to America. And it was a shitty boat ride. And it was really dangerous. And it smelled like barf the entire time. But she made it. Now, Brynhild's sister had changed her name to Nellie when she got to America. So she had more of an American sounding name. So Brynhild followed suit and changed her name to Belle. So we're going to refer to her as Belle for the remainder of the story. And Belle stayed with her sister Nellie and her brother-in-law in Chicago until she got settled. Now, unfortunately, the only work that she could find right off the boat was as a servant. She was like, I did not cross the Atlantic on a barf-smelling boat just to be a servant somewhere else. She wanted to be rich. So Belle started hoeing it up and sleeping with as many men as she could, hoping that perhaps one of them would marry her. Great plan. And it worked. And in 1884, Belle married a man named Mads Albert Sorensen, who was also a Norwegian immigrant. And he had some money. Like, he wasn't, like, super rich. But he had enough money that overnight, Belle became a member of the middle class. They were able to buy a home in the Chicago suburbs, and they had nice clothes, and they always had food on the table. Excellent! But that wasn't enough for Belle. Shortly after they were married, the couple adopted a baby from a neighbor whose wife had died and he was unable to take care of the baby. So Belle offered to adopt and raise the girl, whose name was Morgan Couch, but Belle had her name changed to Jenny Olson. Now later, when the neighbor got his life together, he wanted Jenny back, but Belle was like, no, no, she's mine. I'm not giving her back. And they even went to court over it and the court ruled that Belle should retain custody of the baby. Finders keepers, I guess. To bring in a little extra money, the couple also decided to get a couple of boarders to live in the house. One boarder was a physician named Dr. Miller, and the other boarder was a butcher named Peter Gunnis. Now, there were some rumors out there that Belle and Peter Gunnis had an affair while Peter was staying at their home, but there's no way to know. Then, after saving up some cash, Mads gets this brilliant idea. He's like, hey, baby, let's open up a candy store. Belle's like, I, I mean, okay, that sounds great. If it's going to make me rich, let's do it. So they put all of their saved money into opening up a candy store in town. And it didn't just have candy. They had like tobacco, newspapers, a little bit of groceries. And for the first couple of months, the candy store was hopping. Like there's always a lot of excitement when a new candy store opens in town, even now. <laughs> but then business started to slow. And then at the one year mark, things were not going so well. And they were no longer turning a profit. And Belle was freaking out watching the store fail. Like, they put their savings into this candy store. She's like, I don't want to go back to the dark place. I don't want to be poor again. When suddenly, in the middle of the night, the candy store catches fire. And it burns down. Now, luckily, it was the middle of the night. So there was no customers in there. There was nobody there. So nobody got hurt. And Belle was like... Oh no, <laughs> that's so sad. And Mads was actually sad. He's like, shit, I put my life savings into this freaking candy store and it burnt to the ground. But luckily they had fire insurance on the candy store. So the insurance company investigated and questioned Belle and Mads and it was determined that a kerosene lamp malfunctioned and burned down the candy store. So with no foul play suspected, the insurance company paid Mads and Belle their settlement and they used their settlement money to buy themselves a new three-story home. So the candy store chapter of their life was over. Mads and Belle went on to have four children, but it's believed that none None of them were their biological children. Their names were Caroline, Axel, Myrtle, and Lucy. And it seems the kids were just kind of found and taken in and fostered by the couple. And Mads and Belle were collecting government stipends. Caroline and Axel, unfortunately, both died as infants. Caroline died from acute colitis, the symptoms being nausea, fever, diarrhea, stomach pain, and cramping. These symptoms are also symptoms of many types of poisoning. Just saying. But it was, it was acute colitis. Mm -hmm. And Axel died from hydrocephalus, or fluid building up in the brain. Now, infant mortality rates at this time were pretty high. So no foul play was suspected. And of course, Belle and Mads had taken out 
life insurance policies on both of the children and received insurance payouts after both of the children died. Hmm. So now in the house, we have obviously Mads and Belle, and then we have Myrtle, Lucy, and the adopted daughter, Jenny. Mads was then approached by a company offering him a job in what is now Alaska, promising him that there's money to be made. And on the off chance that Mads happened to strike gold, him and his family would be set for life. Now, Belle hears the word gold and she's like, hmm, what gold? You gotta, you gotta go. You gotta go right now. But Mads would have had to leave the family for like minimum a year. And Belle was like, yeah, exactly. That sounds great. (laughs) But Mads was hesitant and he didn't want to leave the family for that long. And Belle spent the next couple of weeks like really working on Mads and trying to convince him to take this job and go and get her some gold. Eventually, Belle wore him down and the couple put up their home as an investment into this new company to secure Mads' position. Are you getting scammy vibes yet? Well, you should be because it was a scam. And fittingly, they found out that this was a scam on April 1st and they nearly lost their home. But luckily, they were able to sue the fraudulent company and just barely save their asses. Now, as far as Belle was concerned, this was all Mads' fault. (laughs) She's like, I don't ask for much. I just want you to make me rich. It's not that complicated. I mean, the candy store was Mads' idea, and he seems incapable of getting an awesome job. Like, come on, Mads, get it together. Now, the last straw, though, Mads did end up getting a job, but he took a night watchman job at a department store. What? I am never going to be rich with you working at a department store, you selfish son of a bitch. Mads is never going to make a ton of money at this dead-end job. So Belle was feeling pretty low. And as if Belle's luck wasn't bad enough, in April 1900, the family home catches fire. Now, it didn't burn like all the way down, but there was a ton of damage. And this fire was determined to be due to a malfunctioning heating unit. But luckily, the family had fire insurance on the home and they received an insurance payout for the damages. So they've had the candy store burn down for which they got insurance money. They had two children die for which they received insurance money. And now the house burned down and they received insurance money for that too. Boy, it's a good thing they had that insurance, you know? Now, in dealing with all of the insurance bullshit and all the paperwork after the house fire, Belle came across Mads' life insurance policies and she found something very interesting. It turns out that Mads had life insurance and it was about to expire. And then he had a new policy that was about to take effect after that one expired. But there happened to be an overlap. So for exactly one day, on exactly July 30th, 1900, if for some reason Mads happened to die, Belle would get a double insurance payout. And wouldn't you know it, on July 30th, 1900, Mads started to feel ill. He went to work in the morning like normal, but he came right back home and he was like, I have a splitting headache. It is killing me. And he just got sicker and sicker throughout the day. And Belle, very worried about her husband, was like, oh my God, what do, you, what do you need, honey? A headache? That's so terrible. And she gave him some quinine powder for the pain and then put him down for a nap, hoping he would sleep it off. But when she went into his bedroom to check on him later, Mads wasn't breathing shocked, panicking, Belle called out for her old tenant that used to live with them, Dr. Miller, and told him to come quickly. But sadly, by the time Dr. Miller got there, Mads was already dead. He died. Dr. Miller called Mads's regular physician, and he came over right away too. And the two doctors are standing there trying to figure out what happened to this guy. Now, Dr. Miller had the suspicion that perhaps Mads had been poisoned with strychnine. But Mads's regular physician was like, "Mm, no, that's crazy. And he had been treating Mads for an enlarged heart. So he assumed, you know what? It was probably just heart failure. It happens. Happens all the time. So because Mads' regular doctor did not suspect any foul play, an autopsy was deemed unnecessary. And since Mads' death was not suspicious, both life insurance policies paid out to Bell. I will say every source listed like a different dollar amount for how much Bell got. But the point is, she did get the double payout and she was, at least for the time being, financially stable. There were several sources that said Bell got over $8,000, which would be equivalent to about $250,000 today. So 
maybe not as wealthy as Belle always dreamed she would be, but it's a pretty good payout if that's what she got. And she's certainly not poor. So there's a lot of insurance payments going around here. <laughs> and people in town are starting to side-eye Belle a little bit. Rightfully so. And she just wasn't loving this negative attention. So she decides, you know, I need a fresh start, new location. And she took some of her insurance money and she purchased a 40-acre farm in LaPorte, Indiana, hoping that she could raise some livestock similar to what she did when she was a child and earn some extra money. As Belle was getting ready to move to her new farm, she bumped into her old tenant, Peter Gunnis. Now, Peter was a recent widower. He was also a Norwegian immigrant, just like Belle was. So they had a lot in common, and sparks flew, I guess, and Peter decided to move with Belle and the kids to the new farm in Indiana. And the two got married. Now, Peter had two kids. He had a young baby and a young daughter that he was taking care of by himself ever since his wife died in childbirth. So marrying and shacking up with the wealthy widow seemed like a pretty solid move. And Peter was a butcher, and he was very handsome. Andy, and so he was a pretty good prospect for Belle to bring with to her farm, you know? So Belle and Peter Gunnis got married on April 1st, 1902, and they got settled in their new farm in Laporte, Indiana. But misfortune seemed to follow Belle everywhere she went. And just a week after their wedding, Peter's baby died while she was alone with Belle in the farmhouse. The cause of death was determined to be fluid buildup in the lungs. But a next door neighbor did not believe that that baby was sick. And they said they had gone over there the night before the baby died. And the baby was laying on the floor, warm and happy by the stove, playing perfectly healthy. So to be perfectly healthy the night before and then dead in the morning, mm, the neighbor wasn't buying it. And the elderly mother of that neighbor, she came up with a theory. And she thought that Belle had put a wet washcloth over the baby's face to cause the fluid in the lungs. And she found it suspicious that Belle then had the baby buried next to her two dead children and dead husband, rather than burying the baby next to her own mother. So red flags are flying next door. But despite neighbors gossiping, there was no formal investigation done. Now, obviously, Peter was devastated, but he did not suspect Belle of any foul play. Then in December of the same year, so like eight months later, Peter had a tragic accident of his own when a sausage grinder fell off of a high shelf and landed on Peter's head. What a freak accident. Right after it happened, Belle sent the oldest daughter, Jenny, over to a neighbor's house to go get some help. And when the neighbors showed up, they found Peter lying on the ground in his bedclothes. It appeared that the sausage grinder had just slipped off the shelf, struck him in the head, causing him to fall. And he injured his nose on the way down and he died. So the neighbors call the coroner and the coroner shows up and he looks around at the scene and he allegedly says, this is a case of murder. Now there was an extensive investigation. And meanwhile, Jenny is overheard telling a classmate, my mama killed my papa. She hit him with a meat cleaver and he died. Don't tell a soul. Now, a coroner's jury was convened and Jenny was brought before the jury where she denied ever saying such things. And when Belle was brought before the jury, she told the jury that Peter kept his slippers next to the stove to keep them warm and dry. And he was just bending down to pick up his slippers when I guess the sausage grinder just slipped off the shelf, striking her poor husband's head. Ultimately, no charges were filed and Peter's death was ruled a tragic accident. But luckily, Belle had life insurance on her husband, Peter, and she received an insurance payout to the tune of a couple thousand dollars. That insurance is really coming in handy. And this money would really come in handy because it turns out Belle was pregnant with Peter's child. So in May 1903, baby Philip joined the family. A year after Peter died via sausage grinder, Peter's brother, Gunt, Gunt, I'm going with Gunt. He came to visit after Peter's death because he wanted to see his niece, Peter's older daughter, Swanhild. Swanhilda? These names, you guys, they're going to kill me. So Swanhild was still living with Belle. Her uncle comes to visit, right? When the uncle gets there, he gets such bad vibes from Belle and from the house that he was like, "Mm, yeah, I'm going to take her 
with me. So he took his niece and brought her back with him to his home in Wisconsin. And it turns out this was a pretty good move because Swanhild would be the only child to survive ever living with Belle. So from 1903 to 1906, Belle was running the farm, basically by herself, with just the help of mostly her older daughter, Jenny. Now, as Jenny was growing into being a teenager, she became quite a beautiful girl, and the boys in town were starting to notice. And honestly, Jenny was getting pretty excited to hopefully just have someone propose so that she can get out of Belle's house, because she was being worked to the bone on this farm. And honestly, she probably suspected that Bell killed Peter. Or maybe even knew Bell killed Peter. There's no way to know. Now, Bell would sometimes hire young men to help her on the farm when there was a lot of work to do. One such man, Emel, a 19 year old that worked on the farm, fell in love with Jenny. And Jenny fell in love with him. Oh, young love. But once Belle realized what was going on behind the curtains at the farm in September 1906, Jenny just disappeared. Poof. Now, people started asking, like, hey, where's Jenny? Haven't seen Jenny in a while. And Belle told everyone and Imel that Jenny had gone to a Lutheran college in California to further her education. And eventually, Imel just moved on from his job at the farm, and that was that. Now, shortly after Jenny disappeared and Imel left the farm, Belle decided to hire a man named Ray Lamphere, who became the full-time employee and farmhand at the farm. And Ray was Belle's right-hand man, and he did everything and anything that Belle asked him to do. Also around the same time, Belle was looking for a new man. And she began putting personal ads in the matrimonial columns of the Chicago and other large neighboring cities' newspapers, usually written in Norwegian to attract another Norwegian immigrant like herself, that read, quote, Personal, comely widow who owns a large farm in one of the finest districts of Laporte County, Indiana, desires to make the acquaintance of a gentleman equally well provided with view of joining fortunes. No replies by letter considered unless sender is willing to follow answer with personal visit. Triflers need not apply, end quote. And she got a bunch of responses. Comely widow? Count me in. And she had a bunch of dudes show up. First, we got John Moe from Elbow Lake, Minnesota. He was a Norwegian immigrant, and he showed up to Belle's farm with a check for her for $1,000 to help her pay her mortgage. And he moved right in. And Belle told all the neighbors that he was her cousin who was here for a visit. John Moe disappeared a week after his arrival. Next up was George Anderson from Tarkio, Missouri, also a Norwegian immigrant, and he showed up to meet Belle, and they sat down at the table to have a nice dinner together to get to know each other. Right away at that first dinner, Belle starts in on the guy, yeah, if this is gonna work, you're gonna need to pay my mortgage. And George tells her, okay, if we decide to get married, I'll happily pay off your house, no problem. Great. Now George slept over because he had come all the way from Missouri, and that night, he awoke in the middle of the night, and when he opened his eyes, he saw Belle standing over him, holding a candle with a sinister look on her face. And as soon as Belle realized he was awake, she just like ran out of the room without saying a word. And George was like, mm, nope. And he just packed his shit and he left and went straight to the train station. And George Anderson would be the only gentleman caller that showed up to Belle's farm to make it out alive. Close call, George. Now, Belle at this point started ordering a bunch of large trunks, like a bunch of big ass wooden trunks from Laporte. And the delivery guy said he was delivering so many of these freaking trunks to this lady. And when he would arrive with them, she would just pick these giant boxes up like they were boxes of marshmallows, he said. The big woman's still there? She would just throw them over her shoulders and carry them into the house like it was nothing. Such a comely widow. Belle kept the shutters closed day and night. And people that traveled past the farm at night said they sometimes saw Belle out digging in the night in the hog pen. In April 1907, and this name I'm going to butcher, Ole B. Budsberg? Ole? I'm going to go with Ole B. He was a wealthy widower from Wisconsin, and he responded to Belle's ad in the paper. He was well off, he was hardworking, and a comely widow sounded like just what he needed. Now, Ole B. had two grown sons, and he kind of thought to himself, if he told his sons 
they would probably try to talk him out of it. So he just didn't tell them. And he packed up his stuff and he went down to Laporte, Indiana to make Belle's acquaintance. Now some time passes and old B's sons realized they hadn't seen their dad in a while. So they went to his house in Wisconsin and he wasn't there. But luckily, he had told some of his neighbors that he was going down to Laporte, Indiana to answer a personal ad. Now, following that lead and researching a little bit, the sons find out Old B was last seen at the Laporte Savings Bank on April 6th, 1907, where he had taken out a mortgage on his land in Wisconsin, signed over a deed, and then cashed out like thousands of dollars. And they also heard that their father had been staying with a local Laporte woman, Belle Gunnis, at her farm. The sons then wrote to Belle directly and asked, hey, is our father still there? Have you seen him? And Belle promptly replied and said, never seen him before in my life. And old B. Budsberg was never seen again. You know, more and more dudes kept showing up to Bell's farm. And in December 1907, Andrew Helgeline, a bachelor farmer from Aberdeen, South Dakota, he began writing to Bell. And they were writing back and forth for about a month because Andrew wanted to get to know Bell better before he just like headed down to Indiana to live with her. And over that month, Bell was really working on him, trying to get him to just come to Laporte. And finally, she sent him a very sexy, romantic love letter on January 13th, 1908 that read, quote, To the dearest friend in the world, no woman in the world is happier than I am. I know that you are now to come to me and be my own. I can tell from your letters that you are the man that I want. It does not take one long to tell when you like a person. And you, I like better than anyone in the world. Think how we will enjoy each other's company. You, the sweetest man in the whole world, we will be all alone with each other. Can you conceive of anything nicer? I think of you constantly. When I hear your name mentioned, and this is when one of the dear children speaks of you, or I hear myself humming it with the words of an old love song it is beautiful music to my ears my heart beats in wild rapture for you my andrew i love you come prepared to stay forever end quote well shit that is a sexy letter and andrew is overwhelmed and leaves for laporte indiana immediately he came with a check for two thousand nine hundred dollars which pretty much was his entire savings and the two deposited the check together at the laporte savings bank in town now, while they were there, Belle convinced Andrew, hey, you should apply for a business loan to start your own business in Laporte, and we can really make a life for ourselves. So he applies for a loan right there and gets approved for a $1,200 loan, which would then be mailed by check to Belle's farm. Now, the hired hand that had worked at Belle's farm, Ray Lamphere, he'd fallen in love with Belle. Belle's really got something going on, doesn't she? <laughs> And Ray was getting pretty jealous of all these dudes showing up all the time to Belle's farm. So when Belle introduces him to her new soon-to-be husband, Andrew, Ray gets super jealous and causes a scene. And Belle's just not having this. She can't deal with this. So she immediately fires Ray right there on February 3rd, 1908. And a few days later, Andrew disappeared into thin air. And then... Belle mysteriously had a $1,200 check that she deposited into her Laporte savings bank. Hmm. Now, probably worried that a grumpy Ray was going to spill the beans on her boyfriend scam, Belle went to the courthouse and she declared that Ray Lamphere was not in his right mind and that he was a menace to the public. And somehow she manages to convince the authorities to have a sanity hearing. But luckily for Ray, his physician came forward and proved that Ray was perfectly fine and healthy, and he was declared sane and let go. Nice try, Bell. But a few days later, Bell went back to the courthouse again, saying that Ray had shown up to the farmhouse and had argued with her. And she said that Ray was a threat to her and her family. And he was charged with trespassing. Now, meanwhile, in South Dakota, Andrew Helgeline's brother was getting worried that he hadn't seen his brother in a while. So the brother goes to Andrew's house and he finds all the love letters from Belle. So he wrote to Belle directly and was like, hey, have you seen my brother Andrew? He's missing. And Belle replied to the brother and said, no, he's not here. He was here, but he just took some money and ran away. I think he went to Norway to visit family. The brother was like, no, he was supposed to come back here. He wouldn't have just gone to Norway and not told me. That's, that's bullshit. Last time he was seen, he was seen with you. So where is he? And Belle replies, you know, I don't know where he is, but if you want to come here and look for him, you can. But just so you know, searching for a missing person can get 
pretty expensive. So if you want my help looking for him, you're going to need to pay me for my services, just so you know. And the brother starts making plans to get down to LaPorte, Indiana to go look for his brother. But he's not going to be able to make it down there for a couple of weeks. So now... Belle's starting to feel a little antsy. She's kind of worried about Ray. She's kind of worried about Andrew's brother possibly showing up to look for him. And Belle decides to go to a lawyer in town. And she tells the lawyer that Ray threatened her life and threatened to burn her house down. And she said she wanted to write up her will just in case Ray went through with it. And Belle left her entire estate to her children. Now, right after Belle fired Ray, she hired a replacement named Joe Maxson. And he was given a room in the farmhouse on the second floor. And on April 28th, 1908, Joe awoke to the smell of smoke. When he opened his bedroom door, he was met with a wall of flames. He started screaming out for Belle and the kids, but he got no answer. Now, Joe was still in his undies and he jumped out of the second floor window and he survived the fire and he ran into town to go get some help. But by the time help arrived, the farmhouse was just smoking ruins. Belle's house burned down again. As the ruins were examined, four bodies were found. The bodies of the three children, Philip, Myrtle and Lucy, and the body of Belle Gunness, who had been decapitated. There was no head, and the head was never found. Now, County Sheriff Albert Smutzer was on the scene at Belle's house, and he knew about the drama with Belle and Ray, and how she had just gone to a lawyer and, like, updated her will. So he knew about the threats. Like, Ray threatened to kill her and burn her house down. Obviously, it was Ray because here she is dead and her house is burnt down. So he sent two deputies to go arrest Ray Lamphere and two deputies to continue searching the smoking ruins. Now, when police got to Ray, Ray told them that he had seen the smoke coming from Bell's house, but he thought he better not get involved because he didn't want to be blamed. Now, police pretty much took that as an admission of guilt. <laughs> And so they took Ray and they showed him the charred bodies of the three children. And they said to him, here you go. Here's your handiwork. What do you think of it now? And Ray was horrified, shocked, sick to his stomach. He'd never seen anything so awful. And again, he claimed he had nothing to do with it. But a local neighborhood boy came forward and said that he saw Ray running away from the burning home. And the police took the little boy's word over Ray's constant cries of innocence, and they charged Ray with murder and arson. So investigators, along with volunteers and neighbors, they're all digging through the ruins, right? And as they're all looking, all the neighbors are gossiping. And several neighbors had seen the bodies, like, right after the fire. And everyone's talking about the headless body. And many were believing that was not Belle. So the body, if it had its head, would have stood about... 5'3", and the body probably only weighed about 130 pounds. Now, Belle stood at about 5'10", and was over 200 pounds. So people were talking, and they were saying, there is no way that that was Belle. Then the town dentist came forward, and he was like, so if you guys happen to find any teeth or dental work, I'm the only dentist in town. I've seen every mouth in town. I can make an identification from teeth. Sure enough... Lying on the ground, they find a piece of dental bridge work. And it was sent straight to the dentist. And the dentist is like, oh yeah, that's Bell's. I did that bridge. So the coroner was like, well, that's good enough for me. And they said that the body with no head was absolutely Bell Gunnis because her bridge was found right next to the body. Case closed. So people are still sifting through the rubble, I mean, for days. And who shows up? to look for his brother, but Isle Helgelin, Andrew Helgelin's brother. And he's like, oh shit, I'm too late. But he jumps right in and starts helping search through the rubble. And they all start finding a bunch of men's watches. Look at all these watches. There's like eight watches. And they keep looking and they start finding things like teeth. And this looks like a bone. Then Andrew's brother leans down and sees some fabric wrapped around something. And it kind of smells. He unwraps the cloth and he sees his brother's head. Just Andrew's head wrapped in cloth. Okay, so now things are looking pretty grim and people are digging feverishly. They're finding more bones. They're finding more teeth. They're all yelling, keep digging. Then Joe Maxson, the farmhand who was in the burning house but had gotten out, he found out that they were finding like 
body parts at the farm. And he came forward and said that when he first started working for Bell, Bell told him that the hog pen needed to be leveled out. There was all these dents in the dirt because Bell said she had been burying rubbish garbage and it had all sunk down so she had joe bring wheelbarrows of dirt to the hog pen and smooth it all out but now that they were finding like you know bones and teeth and heads joe was starting to think maybe it wasn't garbage that was buried out in the hog pen and on may 5th they found five bodies the first body they found was jenny olson buried in a wooden trunk. I guess she didn't go to college in California after all. Then they found the rest of Andrew Helgeline, also in a wooden trunk. The third body they found was an unidentified man. And the fourth and fifth bodies they found were of unidentified eight-year-old children. The next day, they found four more bodies. And then they found a bunch of just random body parts all over the damn farm. On May 9th, they found a bunch of burlap sacks full of body parts buried in Belle's own personal graveyard. Yeah. And in the end, they were able to piece together 14 whole bodies. But the rest that they found were just pieces and they couldn't piece them all together. Like the recovery method was very crude. It was just some cops and a bunch of farmers with shovels, you know. And it was 1908. It wasn't a super organized operation. But Based on the random parts that they had left over, they estimated that the total number of murder victims found on Bell's farm could be as high as 40. 40! Now, the identified victims were Ole B. Budsberg from Wisconsin, Thomas Linbo from Chicago, Henry Gerholt from Wisconsin, Olaf Svenharud from Chicago, John Moe from Elbow Lake, Minnesota, Olaf Lindlube from Wisconsin, Benjamin Carling from Chicago, and of course, Jenny Olson, the oldest daughter, and the three other children, Philip, Myrtle, and Lucy. And let's not forget to add in Mads Albert Sorensen and Peter Gunnis. Twelve people were also identified as missing and most likely victims of Bell's because they all mentioned they were off to meet a wealthy widow on a farm in Laporte, Indiana. So probably Bell. And five people were listed as missing in the Laporte area that may be victims of Bell's, but it was never proven. Now, as for Ray, he was tried for murder and arson, and he pled innocent of all charges. And he mainly used the defense that he didn't believe that the body was even Bell's at all. And his lawyer argued that he had evidence to prove that that dental bridge was planted. One thing that made Ray look guilty was that when he was searched, they found items on him that belonged to some of Bell's murder victims. But he told the police they were gifts from Bell. Now, ultimately, Ray was acquitted of the murder charges, but he was found guilty of the arson. And he was sentenced to 21 years in the state prison in Michigan City, Indiana. And Ray died not that long after in December of 1909 from tuberculosis. But before Ray died, he spoke to a priest and he told the priest that Belle had killed a shit ton of people and that Ray had helped her bury a bunch of the bodies on the farm. But he swore he never killed anyone. And he said that he believed Belle was most certainly alive. Okay, so this is what Ray told the priest that Belle did, okay? She would get these guys to come visit. She'd make them comfy. She'd charm them. She'd cook for them. And then she drugged their coffee and then hit them over the head with a meat cleaver. Or she would wait until they fell asleep. Then she would sneak into their room by candlelight and chloroform them. Then the strong 48-year-old Belle would carry these men down into the basement, dismember them, wrap up the parts, carry them out to the farm and bury them in her own private graveyard or in the hog pen. Or she sometimes dumped the bodies into the hog scalding vat, or she would simply cover the bodies with quicklime. If she was feeling extra tired and didn't feel like doing a lot of extra work, she would just feed the bodies to the hogs, which is just horrifying. Now, as for who Ray said the headless woman really was, he said Belle lured a woman from Chicago just a few days before the fire with promises of a housekeeping job. When she arrived, Belle allegedly drugged her, hit her over the head with the meat cleaver, and decapitated her. She allegedly tied weights to the head and disposed of it in a swamp. Then she went back to the body and dressed it in her clothes, removed her own dental bridge, and laid it next to the body so that it would be identified as Belle's body. 
Then Ray claimed that Bell chloroformed all three children, smothered them, and then lit the house up and ran for it. Wow. And how did Ray know all of this? Well, he claims that Bell told him that was her plan, and then she told him to meet her at a specific location just outside the farm, and that she would meet him after the house was on fire and they would run away together. But Bell never showed up. Very interesting. Ray claimed that Bell killed 42 people and that she had stolen a total of over $250,000, which at this time would be equivalent to $6.7 million. <laughs> and after Ray made these claims, investigators went and checked Bell's bank and she had withdrawn everything from her bank right before the fire. Word spread about all the bodies and all the body parts that were found at Bell's farm. And hundreds of people came from all over to see Mrs. Gunnis's murder farm. It was quite the tourist attraction. Everyone just wanted to go and see where a bunch of bodies had been buried. And eat some popcorn and get a postcard. Seriously. <laughs> I'm sure people were pretty bored in 1908. So... Over the decades after the fire, there were many alleged sightings of Belle Gunness. It was reported that Belle was living in a Mississippi town where she owned a ton of land and was a prominent figure in the town. Many people reported just seeing her around the streets of Chicago. There were reports suggesting that Belle was Esther Carlson, who was arrested in LA for poisoning a man named August Lindstrom, a Norwegian man, for his money in 1931. That sounds like Belle. Two people that knew Belle were shown photos of Esther, and they both claimed to recognize her as Belle. But it was never proven, and Esther Carlson died while awaiting trial. So we'll never know. The unidentified headless woman was buried next to Mads in Forest Park, Illinois, because they thought it was Belle. And in 2007, with the permission of descendants of Bell's sister, a team of forensic anthropologists exhumed the body and they were going to try and figure out what the real identity of the woman was, but they were unsuccessful. So we still don't know who the headless woman really was. And that is it. <laughs> We will probably never know what happened to Belle Gunness. Never know how many people exactly she killed and who they all were. Damn. She burned a lot of shit down and killed a lot of people just for money. It's crazy. But anyway, that's the end. That is today's story about Belle Gunness. Hell's Bell. Possibly America's first female serial killer. I don't know. But she killed a lot of freaking people, perhaps. And maybe got away with it. Crazy. If you liked this video, give me a like, leave me a comment, let me know what you thought of today's story, and feel free to request a case in the comments if you have a case you want me to cover on cleaning and crime. Thank you so much for watching today's episode, and I'll see you next week. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. See you next time. Bye.